I have called this fifth lecture Pondering Divine Justice, and then to that initial title, title Pondering Divine Justice, I've added in typical academic fashion a subtitle. When I say predictable, by the way, it struck me when I did my PhD thesis that it had a title and a subtitle, and I went and looked through a catalog of PhD theses, and I couldn't find one that didn't have a title and a subtitle. It clearly is a a, a, a convention far beyond what I thought it would be. There is a much briefer way of referring to the issue which I want to begin to raise, and then I'll continue to talk about it through the second lecture this afternoon. There's a briefer way to talk about this set of issues than to call it pondering divine justice. And since this abbreviated fashion is the way in which I will chiefly be referring to this issue for the next two lectures, let me explain it. The, the abbreviated shorthand uh, and, and probably more accurate way of referring to uh, the issues uh, which we'll address for the first couple of hours this afternoon is to say that I'm going to talk about the theodicy issue. And if I tell you the etymology of theodicy, uh, I think that will get us started on uh, what these issues are all about, but then I'm going to suggest that there are at least two other ways uh, that have been helpful for me as I've tried to think about what's going on here. Theos, in the word theodicy, means God or divine, and uh, uh, the last two syllables of theodicy come from the Greek word dk, which means justice. So etymologically, theodicy means divine justice. And that suggests that the chief issue here is the following. Can one reconcile the alleged existence of powerful and benevolent deities with the existence of apparent injustice? So the theodicy problem stated thusly, where the word means divine justice, is that. Can you reconcile the two halves of that word. Can you say, yes, there is a God, or there are gods, or there is a goddess, uh, they are uh, powerful, uh, they are benevolent, and yet there is uh, a, a human, or, and is there human justice on earth, or it appears that there's injustice, uh, and how does one reconcile the two parts of that word? As I began to say a moment ago, I think there are two additional ways to talk about what's really going on here that I have found much more helpful myself than simply to explore the meanings of the four syllables in the word theodicy. The first of them is uh, not entirely conventional, but it's hardly my own, what I label the theodicy trilemma. Uh, I'm going to go through that, and then I'll move to one that is more my own, the way in which I think... Uh, the, the theodicy dilemma is presented most powerfully. First then, one way of talking about this set of issues is to call it the theodicy trilemma. Now, as far as I know, no English dictionary admits that word. Uh, it is a neologism, and it's not even my neologism, and I don't even know to whom to credit it, actually. It's become something of a convention in theological and religious studies circles to talk about a trilemma. And obviously, it's a play on the word dilemma, suggesting that maybe there are three corners or three angles or three sides to this issue, an explication of which will help us think about it, and I think that is the case. So imagine, if you will, a triangle. And I've tried hard throughout these lectures to get away without the use of a chalkboard, and, and I don't have one, so I'll try to have to continue to try. This is the one point, probably, where a chalkboard or something to write upon would be most helpful for me. So. Uh, in the absence of that, please use your imaginations. Imagine a triangle, and imagine the three angles or sides, doesn't matter which, let's call them angles just because we can get them further separated that way. Imagine that the three triangles of this, three angles of this triangle are labeled as follows. One of the angles is called omnipotent gods or goddesses or deities, an omnipotent divine power. A second angle is labeled benevolent divine power, benevolent gods, goddesses, a collection of 
deities or a god. And the third angle is called human injustice or apparently innocent human suffering. So we've got three angles or three sides to the triangle. A god who can do anything. And I'll, I'll just use paraphrastically a single deity now because you know that I mean... I, I'm not limiting this to monotheism, and I could be referring to all of them. It's going to take me a long time always to say God, goddesses, whatever. So I'll just say, at one corner is a powerful God, an omnipotent God who can do anything. And another corner is a benevolent God, a God who wishes to do the right thing, a benevolent and just God, who wishes to do the merciful and the just thing for humanity. And in the third corner is apparently innocent human suffering or human injustice. The theodicy problem is, can you keep all three of those together? To mix metaphors rather boldly, can you square the triangle? Does it make sense for there to be, for you to affirm the existence of a deity who can do anything, a deity who wants to be just and to act benevolently, can you reconcile those two with the existence of what looks to be injustice or what appears to be innocent uh, human suffering? That, as I say, is, a, is, is, is not my own. It's, it's, a, it's a way of thinking about this issue that a lot of people have found helpful. I, I want now to move to a, a, yet a third way to talk about this, having gone through the etymological and this uh, uh, geometric uh, attempt to talk about this issue, to, to the way in which I think about it myself. Uh, and this, again, may show up somewhere else. I don't know, but it's, as far as I know, uh, in pointed fashion, uh, my own. For me, the issue that's lying behind what we can call the theodicy problem or pondering divine justice or the theodicy trilemma is the following. Does human experience validate or rebut religious dogma? And by that I mean the following. Every religion that I know of has as among its dogmatic statements the claims that there is justice in the world or if understood correctly, you will see that there really is no such thing as innocent suffering. And in Sunday school or Saturday school or during the month of Ramadan or whatever, various religious peoples in various religious traditions learn these religious dogmas, maybe memorize them, maybe have to trot them out as a part of some initiation ceremony. But does grinding flesh and blood, true to life, everyday sweating reality make sense of these dogmas, or does it rather prove, as many people have argued, that these dogmas are in fact pious frauds, that they're uh, uh, rosy colored glasses fictions, that they're ways by which religions would like to try to make the claim that you can reconcile omnipotent and malevolent deities to what looks like human injustice or human innocent suffering, but in fact it just doesn't work that way. Now, I want to conclude this introduction by saying something quite paradoxical, uh, uh, but also true, uh, I think. And that is, first, a lot of people have argued that this question is the origin of religion. When I went through, as I attempted to do in my first lecture yesterday afternoon, various explanations, various explanations for the origin, uh, uh, a pers a persistence, continuation of religion, I could have put this one here. There are those who've argued the origin of religion is people's attempts to find answers to what look like uh, 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 the evil doing well uh, 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 and, and the good dying young uh, in the history of human life. In fact, when, as I mentioned in passing yesterday, uh, a number of years ago at Dartmouth with a colleague of mine, I was assigned the task by the department of trying to think of a new way to introduce students to religion, and the results were the predecessors of the kinds of uh, lectures that I'm attempting to present today, there were those among my immediate and other colleagues who said the way to begin the study of religion is with the theodicy problem, because that's how religion them, religions themselves begin. That on the table, let me give you the paradoxical side of it. The other side of that is that any number of sociological inquiries, sort of census-like questions, asking people how they feel about religion, any number of them have produced the conclusion that that which turns more people away from religion than any other single category is their belief that their religion does not correspond to their experience. That it's got a pietistic, dogmatic answer to what looks like injustice or innocent suffering, but that it doesn't work. It doesn't correspond with their experience. So the paradox are, is that there are both those out there who are saying this is what prompts religion, 
And yet there are those out there saying this is what prompts irreligion. This is what turns previously religious people away from their religion. And one of the reasons I accent the latter is I will say a couple of times throughout this first lecture, all right, there's a good answer, but is it good enough? I'll say it when we get to the book of Job, and I may say it in, in the second lecture this afternoon. And I want to do that because I don't want, I hope you don't think that, that, uh, that I have, I'm sure I've got all kinds of vices, but I hope I don't fall prey to the vice of a failure of courage in surmounting this issue. And I do want to be very clear to you in saying, if you come out of hearing me or reading a whole lot of people talk about answers to the theodicy problem saying it doesn't work, or that really won't wash with the kind of experience that I know of or that I myself have experienced, you're in good company. A lot of people have reached similar conclusions. That is uh, uh, various ways of conceiving the theodicy problem. However, con however we conceive the theodicy problem, and I'm going to, because it's the one that I like, probably come back most often to the experience versus dogma way of conceiving it. However we conceive of it, there are a series of solutions that many of the world's religions have come to, to the theodicy problem. And therefore, before we ever talk about one uh, a sustained example of this in the book of Job, and then go on in the next le lecture to talk at length about Christianity and more briefly about Buddhism and Hinduism, I want to, in, in the abstract, list for you five ways in which various religions, and I may exemplify some of these occasionally, have attempted to solve the theodicy problem. And when I say various religions, that's not quite true. Four of them work for religions, and one of them doesn't at all. Four attempted solutions to the theodicy problem, which you could probably find instances of in almost every world religion. I, I will probably, I, I will seize upon what seems to me the, the, the central answer of a religion to the theodicy problem, but they're all pretty comprehensive in, in occasionally choosing others of these. The first solution that obviously, which is the least religious and or is plainly irreligious, is to say, yes, I understand the trilemma so posed, to benevolent deities, omnipotent deities, and innocent suffering and justice, or I understand the dilemma posed is experience versus dogma. The solution is obvious. The solution is you cannot reconcile that also with DK. You cannot reconcile the existence of a deity with human injustice and innocent suffering? And the answer is easy. Remove those corners that talk about gods at all. There is no answer to the theodicy problem because there are no benevolent, omnipotent deities. If any of you have read uh, any of the novels or prose of um, any number of folks who have responded to the Holocaust in the last 40 or 50 years, you will have come upon this solution. Because one of the response of numbers of Jewish and non-Jewish thinkers to uh, the Holocaust has been to say, if anybody needed additional evidence for the fact that there cannot possibly be an omnipotent benevolent deity, the, the a fortiori proof of that is the Holocaust. That's it. Between what, five and nine million Jews, between two and four million Jewish children, to say nothing of lots of other groups, there's the proof par excellence. Obviously, there cannot be a benevolent, omnipotent deity, because any such deity could not possibly have allowed such a thing to have occurred. For religious answers, after this uh, 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 answer which abandons uh, uh, theism altogether, a second answer is dualism, and having explained this, then I'll give you an example and it may make it clearer. Se second ample example is to say, yes, there are powerful, omnipotent, benevolent deities, and yes, there is apparently innocent human suffering, and the answer to that is that the omnipotent deities who are benevolent are not the only divine powers. There are also very powerful deities or semi-divine beings who are malignant, who have malicious, malevolent intents instead of benevolent intents. And with the possible exception of the Hindu solution, which we'll conclude with today, this may be the most rational solution to the problem of suffering. It is a very rational answer. Yes, there are a series of gods up there who will good and who would like human affairs to run justly. But there are also a series of beings up there who will malevolent thoughts and who wish human affairs to run unjustly or according to some standard of injustice. And the cosmos is a continuing struggle between those kinds of deities. And when the malevolent powers have the upper hand, then things are going to go powerfully. Lots of ancient Gnosticisms 
Gnosticism is a kind of catch-all category to refer to a group of Mediterranean religions that argued that knowledge was the key. Uh, the Greek word for knowledge is gnosis or gnosis. And therefore, we, if, if anything you've heard about Gnosticism sounds a bit vague, again, that's pretty fair because there are so many different collections of religions that we dump into the can that we call Gnosticism that one cannot but be vague in talking about it fairly comprehensively. But lots of ancient religions to which we attach the label uh, Gnosticism are dualisms, have a good God and a bad God. I said in passing that uh, a lot of historians of religion would say that it's self-evident that Christianity is not a monotheism, whatever its adherents claim. As soon as you're going to talk about a figure like the Mother of God or the Blessed Virgin Mary and saints, you're probably not talking monotheistically, many historians of religion would say. So too, any brands of Christianity which make out of hasatan, the Hebrew word for the adversary, and I'll return to that when I get to Job, that make out of Satan or Diabolos the devil a semi-divine or a divine-like figure who's responsible for human suffering or human injustice, Those, the, the motive behind that uh, is probably, or at least partially, a solution to the problem of theodicy. So uh, 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 those elements within Christianity, and not all do, which accent the role of Satan or of the devil, uh, are probably not monotheistic, but may be very logical in their solution to the problem of suffering. Third, and uh, midway in going through uh, five uh, uh, solutions to the problem of suffering, back to almost all of them will come, I, I will come. When I say the problem of suffering, by the way, again, I'm using a periphrasis for the issue, the theodicy issue. It's sometimes called the problem of evil or the problem of suffering or the theodicy problem or any of the other terms that I've used for it today. Third is to argue that we are all guilty. And let me go back to the trilemma. Benevolent deities, omnipotent deities, apparently innocent human suffering or apparent injustice. This solution says get rid of that adjective or that adverb. Yes, there is human suffering. Yes, there is injustice. But it's only, apparent, it's only apparently innocent human suffering because we are all guilty. All human beings as human beings are guilty and are deserving of whatever kinds of suffering or injustice through which they go. Now, to elaborate briefly upon this, just to give you a couple of instances of it, and I think you could imagine, at least as well as I can, some of the versions of this. Some versions include statements like the following, that even th th that accent intention over acts. And one way to approach this, th this solution to it is to say, even if it's the case that you have never murdered, that you have never committed adultery, that you, you know, the first time, what went, after my undergraduate degree, I was a student at Cambridge University, and that's the first time I read the New Testament in Greek. And it was the first time I understood the freedom that Anglican bishops had, because I was reading uh, the New Testament with an Anglican bishop called J.A.T. Robinson, who wrote a very famous book called Honest to God in the 1960s. And we were reading through the Sermon on the Mount, and when we got to the, 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 the section in the Sermon about, on the Mount where it says, you have heard X, but I want to tell you Y, and I was translating, and as you have heard, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that it's that to lust after the woman across the street is as bad as committing adultery, to which John Robinson, and here I am, a 21-year-old, easily shocked st student, said, you know, it probably is the case that to lust after the woman across the street is as bad as committing adultery, but it sure isn't as good. <laughs> Well, any statement that would say that to lust after a woman on the other side, and, and you know, it's the thing that Jimmy Carter admitted in a Playboy interview that had run through his uh, uh, mind. Uh, any, any, any religious uh, analysis of that says that's right. To think a thought like that is at least as bad as doing it, or is as bad as doing it. it, it when you're on that level, then I think we probably are all honest enough with ourselves to say, yep, we are all guilty. We probably have always had and probably very frequently had impulses upon which we haven't acted, but that we cannot say were perfectly innocent or altogether laudable in, uh, impulses. Uh, the Book of Common Prayer, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, refers to this, of course, as the devices and the desires of the human heart, which, if you, any of you is a P.D. James fan, as am I, is also the title of the latest P.D. James uh, uh, murder. Uh, 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 novel. I've, I'm, I've just begun it. I don't know if people get murdered in it, uh, except for the one who the death is referred to on the first page. Now, another example uh, of this, uh, since I said I'd give you a couple of examples of we are all guilty, beyond saying that any kind of evil intent or uh, intention is as bad as committing an evil act, uh, uh, is the category of original sin. 
And uh, when Christianity, for example, refers to original sin, that is, a, that is an example of we are all guilty. Whatever you think of yourself, however innocently you imagine yourself or imagine your children. And before we're finished this morning, before we're finished this afternoon, I will give you John Calvin's description of children, and it's one you can probably imagine already. Uh, all of us, even as children, are unredeemably guilty because of the fact of, of, of original sin. That inborn in us as human specimens, as, as members of Homo sapiens, is the fact that we are guilty. Fourth solution to the theodicy problem is what I call, and others have too, suffer, I think so, I'm not sure if this phrase is original or not, that suffering is educative. That is to say, yes, there are benevolent deities, yes, there are omnipotent deities, and yes, there is innocent suffering, but the suffering exists for a reason. So it is visited upon you innocently, but you are to learn something through your suffering, and the something that you learn through your suffering does you salvific or religious or cosmological good. Parade example of this is an element in Christian thought, which says the following. One of the things we learn when we suffer is that we cannot attain salvation or happiness or anything like that on our own. So suffering serves an important function. It teaches us that we're not as self-sufficient as we thought we were. We've learned that through our suffering. Having learned that we're not as self-sufficient as we thought we are, perhaps we're prepared to throw ourselves at the mercy of God. And when we throw ourselves at the mercy of God, we are then candidates for salvation. So to get from place A to place B, from where we were, to being coming candidates of salvation, we need to suffer because, says this answer to the theodicy problem, the only way that we'll learn the important, the truly important religious lessons is to go through that process of suffering. And finally, and I suppose most obviously of all, and all of you, I think if I had asked you to guess this, probably could have come upon this one, a fifth and very popular solution is to argue that suffering is temporary. Works for any kind of karmic system, any kind of system that talks about transmigration of souls and rebirth, works for any kind of a system that talks about a blessed or a, uh, a punished afterlife. So whenever one hears about in India transmigration or within Christianity the possibility of an afterlife, that provides a, pro a solution to this problem. Yes, it looks like the good die young and the wicked get ahead, but it looks like that only if you're so benighted that you assume real reality or true reality is this brief span of years that we have on the earth. That's a, that's a flash in the pan. That's a very brief period compared with, with authentic reality which is the entire period uh, of, of the universe, uh, uh, eons, and those who may appear to be suffering on this uh, earth will be rewarded in the afterlife or will be rewarded in the Indian system in their next life or in one of their next lives, and therefore, though it looks like we suffer right now, it's extremely temporary. To say that those five solutions are the only solutions to the problem of suffering is, of course, uh, obviously wrong, and you will know that at least as well as I do. I want, however, to conclude with them, and I do think one could make the case that they are the five that, that show up more often than anything else, and I want to conclude with them because I want to give you now an instance of the theodicy problem, uh, especially viewed as the, uh, uh, as the conflict between dogma and experience, and I want to give you an instance of the theodicy problem by offering you eventually a reading of the book of Job. Book of Job, as you almost certainly know, shows up now in the Hebrew Bible or in what Christians call the Old Testament. Uh, scholars, biblical scholars like myself, tend to date Job to the 6th century B.C., but questions like the literary history of the book and when we date it are going to be, for what I want to say, less important than the plot of the book and the issues of how it uh, confronts uh, innocent suffering. I think Job is a particularly good example because... Uh, well, for several reasons, because the book has been used by so many moderns as an instance of innocent suffering. The 19th century Danish existentialist Kierkegaard loved the book of Job and wrote often about the book of Job. Uh, the great 20th century Jewish scholar Martin Buber returned over and over again to the book of Job. And as I mentioned yesterday, the uh, graduate of the Hotchkiss School, um, at Yale College and the Harvard Law School, uh, 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 um, Archibald MacLeish wrote a play called J.B., which all of us had to read in high school or college, and maybe some of you have read uh, in, in, in your lives uh, as, as well. Uh, there's an accepted adjective, Jobin, to refer to innocent suffering. 
and 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 therefore its status as a kind of paradigm of innocent suffering is something that perhaps we can admit as a given. I do hope that looking at Job and at this book, if you have the chance to read it or if you have read it before, you can be a little bit more sympathetic to the protagonist of the book, to uh, Job himself, than are his three friends. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself because we haven't gone through the plot, but those of you who know the book know that three friends, in quotes, show up on the scene and uh, trot out some, some, some standard pieties to Job and they don't work very well. Now, the reason they don't work very well, and the real reason that I choose the book of Job, is that Job is to his three friends as experience is to dogma. I'll give you instances of that in a moment, but essentially, the non-Jobin characters in the book, throughout the poetic dialogues of the book, come on the scene and quote out of the Hebrew Bible to Job, give him instances of the problem of the answers to the problem of suffering from various places in in in, in ancient Israelite thought. But nowhere does any one of them take serious account of Job's experience, and that's what so infuriates Job. Instead of trotting out these pieties, wouldn't you please look at me? When I look at Job, my portrait of Job is nothing like uh, uh, the, uh, a patient Job. And somehow the figure of Job as a patient figure has made its way into, as, as a kind of an aphorism, and as at least one of you knows, if there's a paradigmatic figure of impatience in the Old Testament, it is Job. He's radically uh, uh, impatient. Uh, he's impatient with what he sees as God is a kind of baleful eye in the sky instead of someone helping him out. He's impatient with what's happened to him. But above all, he's impatient with his three sycophantish, toadying friends who, who cannot take the leap of taking seriously Job's experience. Instead of taking seriously Job's experience, continue to rely upon Pat. Uh, 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 dogmas over and over again. My portrait of Job is, 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 is a kind of ancient Near Eastern archaeological portrait. When I think of Job, I see him sitting on a garbage pile that normally sat just outside ancient Near Eastern cities, a pile of awful, O-F-F-A-L, and Job is, sitting, Job is sitting on this pile of awful, uh, uh, infected with some hideous skin disease, and he's picked up a pot shard and he's scratching. Uh, 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 the, 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 the skin disease on top of his losing his fortune uh, and his family. And, and, and that portrait of Job, I hope, is one that is more in accord with what Job himself would like, and that is that some attention be paid to his experience than what he gets from the three other human characters in the main part of the book. The book of Job is divided into a prologue, uh, uh, some dialogues, a voice from the whirlwind, and an epilogue. And about each one of these, I want to say a few things. In the prologue, which corresponds to the first two chapters of Job, and they are in prose, like most of the book of Job, which is in poetry, it's also very unusual poetry, a poetry that's quite different from any poetry in the Hebrew Bible, and the language is, 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 uh, is an odd kind of poetic dialect. Uh, many have suggested that, in fact, the origin of the book of Job is that it's Edomite, that it's a part of uh, 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 the, the Syria-Palestine that you and I would call Jordan today. Uh, down there by Petra, uh, and, and the book itself locates Job in Edom. Uh, so it, this may well be a book that came from an extra-Israelite nation that was later on imported into the book of Job. What do we learn first from the two chapters of prose, uh, uh, prose that are the uh, a prologue to the book of Job? Well, we learn that Job was a great man in many senses. He's great because of his great possessions. He's got 7,000 sheep, for example. He's great because of his family. He's got, for example, seven sons and three daughters. And that's good in the ancient Near East to have uh, uh, more than twice as many sons as daughters. Much more importantly than either his possessions or his family size, however, is the following. We learn several times in the prologue on the lips, from the lips of God himself, that Job is, quote, upright, blameless, and a fearer of God. Now, I'll make a lot of that, and I'll come back to it, but I want to say that again. We learn several times in the prologue from God himself that Job is upright, blameless, and a fearer of God. Now, this upright person and this person with all those possessions is the subject of a bet, a wager between God and a divine emissary called the adversary. When you reread the book of Job or when you think of the book of Job again, please don't be too hard on the character who's called the adversary in the book of Job. And please don't bring notions about Satan from a thousand years later back into the book of Job. In the book of Job, 
This figure called Hasatan, which is Hebrew or Edomite, for the adversary is a functional definition. It's not a title. It's not the devil or Satan. It's a character that was almost certainly borrowed from the Persian court that operates as do today's KGB or CIA agents. The Persian court had a character in them whose job it was to hang out in bathrooms, to hang out where people were smoking cigars, and I'm using modern terminology, not that the Persians actually smoke cigars, to hang out when people's guard was down and find out when their guard was down, what were they really think, thinking and saying about the king. So that's the adversary's role. Of course, Job says the right things about God when he's on his knees, when he's in public. But does he really think that? And let's see what happens to him if matters go a little bit less well for him. So this adversary, so God says, fine, have at it. Adversary has at Job a couple of times. Job doesn't bat an eyelash. Third time the adversary has at Job, he not only affects his possessions and his family, but Job himself. And Job sinks into this kind of self-possessed, uh, 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 impatient uh, 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 scene, uh, which I tried to describe for you earlier. So that's the prologue. The prologue is followed by 30-odd chapters of poetic dialogue. And here is where Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, enter upon the scene. I'm going to say very little about the, 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 the poetic dialogue, though there, there, there are two points that I will make in just a moment. And I'm going to say very little about these great big chapters of poetic dialogues because so little happens in them. And I think that's the point. If any of you have read or read recently or reread the book of Job and have had the feeling these poetic dialogues are going on, and I don't seem to see much dynamism here, and doesn't appear that much has changed, and nobody's changing anybody's mind, and how come we're going on and on? I think that's precisely the point. Nobody's mind has changed, because the three so-called friends steadfastly refuse to pay attention to Job's demand that they give some credence to his experience. All they can think of are these dogmatic phrases, and I think that one should see them as people sort of storing up gold stars on their forehead. I'd say, see God, isn't that right? Isn't that what we're supposed to say? Okay, if you suffer, it must mean you're wicked. They use a kind of faulty syllogistic logic. And you know, faulty syllogistic logic as in, if my alarm clock doesn't go off, I'll be late for class. I was late for class, therefore my alarm clock did not go off. Uh-uh. Okay, you know that that's faulty. But his friends use that all the time. Since wickedness is, re, is, is paid off by suffering, and Job is suffering, comma, he must be wicked. Now, aside from saying that no progress is made here, let me accent again now, and I'll probably do it later, that we know what the friends don't. So it's not just that one might be tempted to think that, gee, these friends don't seem like characters who are very sympathetic, but we know they're wrong. When they say, Job, you're suffering, it must mean that you're wicked. We know that they're wrong because the God of Israel himself in the prologue has said, Job is upright, blameless, and a fearer of God. Nothing that happens, uh, uh, nothing substantive uh, 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 in, these, in, in these dialogues, aside from making that point that nothing uh, substantive happens and, 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 making, uh, and buttressing that. The other point I want to make is the following. In the period in which the book of Job was written, the notion of personal immortality, or any kind of immortality, group or individual, had not yet entered ancient Judaism. So the option that otherwise might seem as an obvious one in the book of Job is not taken by either Job or by his friends. That is to say, nobody in the book of Job says, just wait a minute, Job. It looks like you're suffering, but wait till you die and then you go to heaven and things will be okay. Nobody takes that option in the book of Job because the thought of group or individual immortality had not yet entered Judaism, and it doesn't for five or six centuries after the composition of the book of Job. It's only in the Hellenistic era, only in the era of the birth of Christianity, that all Mediterranean religions begin to compete with one another by way of trying to make claims about their religion offering its adherents immortality. In this period, and it's not just implicitly ignored, by the way, it's explicitly stated in the book of Job. Job said, I, says, I know this is it. When I die, I will be no more, and that's it. When humans die, they die. So I want an answer now. Don't you dare suggest to me that I'm going to get an answer later, because I know there is no later, or that whatever happens later, it's nothing that could be called uh, human life uh, uh, in, in any kind of authentic sense. Third major movement of the book of Job is the voice from the whirlwind. 
If you're interested in chapters, by the way, and I've not given you very many, the prologue is one through two. Uh, the voice, the uh, 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 endless chapters of poetic dialogue where I have argued, and I hope plausibly, that no progress is made are chapters three through 35. Uh, and actually, in the last few of those, a fourth one of Job, a fourth, fourth friend of Job called Elihu shows up on the scene, but most literary scholars think that check, section of chapters was added later. The whirlwind speech then starts in chapters, uh, chapter 36, and it goes through the very first part of chapter 42. The speech out of the whirlwind is the God of Israel showing up on the scene and just sort of blowing away Job and his friends with an enormous theophany. It's a, it's a cataclysmic sound and light show. He shows up and there is there lightning and thunder and rumbling and Job and his friends are rendered for four and a half chapters completely uh, uh, speechless. And what does the God of Israel say above all? Well, let me give you some examples of what he says above all, uh, although this is not the chief point that I want to make out of the voice from the whirlwind section. He says things like the following. Who is this to Job that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Do you know, and I'm trying to speak in bold print, as it were, uh, uh, when, I, when I get to words like knowledge and know. Uh, who is it that darkens uh, counsel by words without knowledge? Do you know the expanse of the earth? Declare it if you know all this. Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Can you number the months that the goats fulfill? Do you know the time that they bring forth? Is it by your knowledge that the hawk soars? Well, I could go on. I think it's defensible, and I haven't looked it up actually in a, in a thesaurus or a concordance to actually prove this, but that the word, words know and knowledge show up in these few chapters more often than they do anywhere other place in the Hebrew Bible, and the point is clear. The God of Israel simply has a sphere and a capacity for knowledge that's incomparably greater than that of any normal human being. Okay? And in response to that, therefore, Job, Job says, and these are his first words, now I know. Before I did not know, I did not comprehend, but now I know. So one of the effects of the whirlwind speech is for the God of Israel to say, Job, I'm angry with you. And we're going to mollify this in just a moment. But from this section of it, Job, I'm angry with you because you, what you failed to say in all your impatient ranting, what you failed apparently to recognize in all your impatient ranting, is that God knows what you will never know. Uh, and therefore, you've spoken in a way out of ignorance. That's not all he says to Job, and he's going to say something more to Job that in a way puts, makes Job appear in a more positive light when we get to the epilogue. But notice already that this has happened. That already... Something about Job and what he argues finds enormous support in this scene. Why? Because Job based his arguments upon experience, asked his friends to pay attention to his experience as they would not, wanted God to respond to him in some experiential way, and that's exactly what the God of Israel does. Hey, the voice out of the world, and I think the key thing about it is it's a divine experience. Job says, I base my reality upon experience. Can you validate that or not? And the God of Israel does validate it. He validates experiential knowledge, I believe, by giving Job and his friends an extraordinary, important, and glorious experience. So what's important here is not just what the God of Israel says, but the whole setting. The setting of this blast of a theophany. Theophany means divine appearance, in case that term isn't clear. And... Uh, a theophany, it seems to me, is experience par excellence. If you want an experience, I'll give you one. And I'll give you the biggest and most memorable one that you can imagine, a theophany. So even if Job is condemned in here, in, in this speech of the, for, out of the world, he's implicitly, I think, praised. Because what he wanted is precisely what the God of Israel gave him. The epilogue then returns to prose. Final chapter and a half of the book of Job, and it's not even that long, final part of a chapter, uh, Job 42, 7 and following, is, is, is the epilogue to the book, and there are two aspects about this uh, uh, upon which I want to comment. First, and perhaps most importantly, in the epilogue, unlike anything that's preceded this, the God of Israel praises Job and condemns Job's friends. And this is what God himself says. You, Job, or you, excuse me, you all, plural, you, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And I, I wish we had that southernism. That's to say, we don't have a first, we don't have a singular and plural second person in, in English. So I had to say you all. We used to have one, you know. 
but when it when thou and 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 uh, its plural equivalent fell out, we don't have it anymore. You all, Job's friends, have not spoken of me what is right, as has my servant Job. Now, what does that mean? Well, I think what it means is the following, uh, and and I say that very. Uh, uh, straightforwardly, uh, obviously this is an interpretation, uh, and, 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 and crystal clearly I could be wrong. I think what the God of Israel is saying is Job was right in that. He admitted that he didn't understand the universe. He wanted to know more, and he perhaps wanted to have a divine-like knowledge, and that was wrong. But in saying, this doesn't make sense to me. There's a clash between dogma and experience. Job spoke what was right. God condemns Job's friends because they thought they understood the universe perfectly. I think that's what the God of Israel is saying here. You have not said of me what is right, as has my servant Job. Job's friends thought they understood the universe, and they're wrong. Job was a little bit wrong in that he wanted to know more than a human being can know, but he's more right than he is wrong in that at least he admits that he doesn't know the, the, the bottom line of the workings of the universe. Finally, and greatly puzzlingly, and in a way that a lot of people wished they could excise from the book. The, the book of Job, after God says to Job, uh, you've spoken of me what's right, unlike your friends who haven't, the book of Job then ends in a sense where it begins. All his fortunes are restored. He gets, in fact, more wealth and more possessions than he had to begin with. He gets another family back again, and things are all wonderful. It's what's often called the Hollywood ending to the book of Job. Now, what's puzzling and sort of irritating about this is that that's, that looks like straightforward retributive justice, which in many ways the book of Job sought to undercut. Okay, retributive justice is quid pro quo justice. Do good, get good. Do evil, be punished. Well, Job did what was good, apparently, says the God of Israel, and therefore he's rewarded in the end. Now, I, I, how to deal with that is not an easy issue for any of us. I, 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 t I tell you what I think is going on here. I think that the genius of the book of Job is that it's a series of permutations on the theodicy problem. And every time you think you've got a solution, the book is saying, I can undercut that. So we've just about decided that retributive logic won't wash, because it's what Job's friends use. They, they are real exponents of retributive logic. And then the book, after saying that the friend spoke what was wrong, rewards Job in retributive fashion. And I think that's my view is that's by way of saying we could keep spinning this off, off, keep spinning it on forever and ever. Every time you come up with an answer to the theodicy problem, I could demonstrate for you what's wrong with that and offer a better answer. So that in my view, much of the courage and the boldness and the genius of the book of Job is that it is a kind of honest statement that it's not a solution to the theodicy problem because there may not be one, or at least one, that is comprehensible in human terms.